so many communities and in some places that are part of that community. But what's next? What's the future of libraries? So Shakespeare said the past is prologue. So before we can look at the future of public libraries, let's take a quick look at the past. Think of the libraries you learned about in history. It might be the um, libraries from ancient Alexandria or the libraries from monaster monasteries in the Dark Ages. What did those libraries have in common? It was preservation. Society was very tenuous there. And the importance of passing on the knowledge, the information, the story, if you will, on to the next generation was imperative. That was the role of libraries then. So jump to the 19th century. Industrialization is bringing people to the cities for jobs, and the world is going through a big change. Carnegie. Uh, had this thought that uh, he would make a deal with cities and towns. If the cities and towns would come up with a portion of the startup cost and pay the maintenance, he would build a library in their town. This led to the concept of public libraries being supported by tax revenue. Now, what was really important to Carnegie, though, was that anyone, anyone could walk in that public library and improve themselves by what was available there. Libraries begin to stand for easy access to unbiased information. So now we jump to the 1990s, the age of the internet. This is when we start to hear, why do we need public libraries? Just Google it. And there is some truth to that, because the questions coming in libraries at that time changed. They became more in depth, more complex. We no longer got questions like, what was the population of Afghanistan? Instead, we got questions, I know, it's very funny, isn't it? Instead, we get questions like, I need help researching the changing roles of women in Afghan society. It's at this time we also get, we hear the word, the term, digital divide. There have always been have and have nots in any society. But when you layer technology on this, it adds an entirely new dimension to not having. Not having access to a computer and the internet puts you at a distinct disadvantage. And Carnegie recognized this. How could you look for, how can you, he would have recognized this, excuse me. How can, <laughs> he didn't live that long. How can you look for a job? How can you hunt for a job if you don't have, if you can't get online? Libraries did recognize it, and it's at this time when you start seeing computers and internet access being available for free at public libraries. In fact, libraries at that point started to offer classes, how to use a computer, how to search the internet. Today, 2014, a library website acts as another branch. Washington County Lip website. You can uh, access databases, their email and chat reference, you can get online tutoring and online job information all the way through the website. With your mobile app, you can access the library website on your smartphone or your tablet. If you add in the e-books and e-magazines that we offer, you really don't need to leave home in order to have full access to the resources that we offer. And to prove my point, the Washington County branch that gets the most traffic is our website. Last fall, Neil Gaiman, um, best-selling author and all-around just brilliant man, gave a speech that he entitled, uh, How Libraries, Fiction, and Daydreaming Will Save the World. In that speech, Gaiman talks about how we're moving from an information-scarce economy into an information glut. Eric Schmidt of Google estimates that Every day now, we generate the same amount of data that was generated from the dawn of civilization to 2003. That's about five exabytes of data. You could spend your lifetime Googling five exabytes of data. <laughs> but Gaiman goes on to say that we're no longer searching for that specific, that single plant in a desert, but a specific plant in the jungle. We're going to need help navigating the information in order to find what we exactly need. Libraries and librarians are your navigators. So we've seen how historically libraries have adapted and morphed into what society needs. So what's next? What's next in the future? 
I'm going to give you three examples of libraries today that are being very innovative, and they're going to give us a glimpse of what's coming forward. Some of you may have heard of the Bookless Library in San Antonio, Texas. I prefer to call it a paperless library because they have plenty of books. They're just not made out of paper fiber. The library is getting a lot of press because the media seems to think it's a novelty, but in reality, they're doing what libraries have always done. San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the United States, but it ranks 60th in literacy from the 2000 census. The community realized that they needed to offer something more than a traditional library in their space. So there are 70 computers loaded with different kinds of software. And you don't need to worry, there are plenty of books being checked out. They're just going out the door on e-readers. In Orange County, Florida, the residents there realized that they needed to offer more than a computer and internet access. They needed to offer their residents access to emerging technologies. To that end, last month, the Melrose Institute of Innovation, Creativity, and Technology was opened at the Orlando County branch. It boasts a lab that contains sound booths, recording studios, film studios with green screens, simulation, fabrication labs with 3D printers. This is, I know it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> this is audio and visual information, not print, but information nevertheless. In Washington, D.C., the Martin Luther King branch of the D.C. Public Library System last fall opened what they call the Digital Commons. It's a uh, 70 computers full of various different kinds of software, and a part of that is also what they're calling the Dream Lab. It's a collaborative space that includes smart boards and teleconferencing capability. What's interesting about these three branches, three libraries, is that they're changing a library from a place where content is consumed to where it's created. And the director of the Digital Commons went on to say, we're offering a space to entrepreneurs, tech startups, and nonprofits a chance to really scale their venture, their idea. And we're changing what a library is capable of, what it has to offer, and it's still all free with your library card. Wildwood Library, the branch here in Montemite, is undergoing a transformation. Um, most of you probably know in January a pipe burst in the ceiling and it caused significant damage to the building and the furnishings. But my director likes to say we take lemons and make lemonade. So we're taking the opportunity to take a 1990 building and turn it into a 21st century library. Some of the changes that we're taking place are pretty basic. Chairs that accommodate mobile devices. We got rid of the big old reference desk and turned it into a nice consultation where we can talk about those more complicated questions or do training one-on-one. -on -one. And then we also are pursuing a wireless option using tablets for both the staff and customers. So I open this with a quote from Shakespeare. Now I'm going to close it with Facebook. <laughs> a couple years ago, the Ohio Columbus Columbus, Ohio Metropolitan Library asked their 75,000 Facebook fans if they would give them five words that meant their library, and second, give them five words that meant the library in the future to them. They took those sets of words and turned them into a word cloud. <laughs> so look at those words. You can see a lot of the similar ones are in both. But look at the two or three largest in the 20th century, and look at the two or three largest in the 2025 you can see that the emphasis has changed in the future. So what's next for libraries? What is the future of libraries? Well, it's up to you. It's up to all of us to decide what do we need. Thank you very much. <laughs>